All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So today's talk is going to be uh, talking about data sharding, um, specifically how to develop scalable da data applications with Drupal. So um, if everybody can see me. Uh, my name is Toby Hagler. I'm a senior web developer at Phase 2 Technology. Uh, it's a uh, Drupal shop based out of, uh, uh, just outside of DC. So um, one thing uh, I do want to remind everybody uh, the official group of Colin uh, London party, um, the, the Batman uh, Live World Arena Tour, uh, is it, the buses are leaving outside of Fairfield Halls here uh, sharply at 4 o'clock. So uh, I'll make this fast. That way everybody can get to the bus. Um, so what I'm going to go over today, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, uh, first of all, uh, reasons that you may have for sharding data. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, problems that you might have. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple of use cases that are fairly generic enough that maybe they can apply to you. Um, I'm going to actually talk about the, the, the types of scaling and sharding. Um, I'm going to kind of give you the how the, 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 and the what of um, horizontal and vertical uh, partitioning and federation. Um, and and kind of give you some of the options that you have while sharding data in Drupal. So first, uh, first and foremost, uh, you're, you're here because you want to talk about sharding specifically for scale. So I want to talk a little bit about the differences between horizontal and vertical scaling. Um, and just by show of hands, is, is, it, is anyone here familiar with the difference between horizontal and vertical? OK, good, good number of uh, folks. So um, the, the short answer is horizontal scale. Uh, you're, you're going out horizontally. Uh, it's, it's real easy to just add more machines. Um, think of a load balanced environment. Um, you've got a load balancer and three web machines behind it. Um, you need more horsepower. You can just add a fourth and a fifth and, and an nth web server uh, behind it. Uh, vertical, vertical scale um, is just making the machine bigger and stronger, adding more memory, adding more capacity, adding more resources to the same machine. Um, the, uh, the, the, the downside is uh, with horizontal scale, um, you face costs. Um, it's, it, it's more costly to create more machines, to instantiate more, more cloud servers. Um, with uh, vertical scaling, um, no matter how much memory, how, ma how many more CPUs you put in that machine, you're going to hit a wall at some point. So sharding, uh, sharding helps with that. Um, so I'm going to talk. Uh, a little bit about sharding, what, what it is, specifically the two main types of sharding, which is partitioning and federation. That's s pretty much synonymous with horizontal and, and vertical uh, sharding, uh, respectively. So I'll talk about how, it's, how it helps and uh, sort of the differences that you have to think about when you're dealing with normally a monolithic uh, Drupal database. So what exactly is sharding? So simply put, Sharding is just breaking a whole thing uh, into shards, into smaller pieces. Um, so uh, you, why would you do that? Well, smaller pieces, they're more manageable. You can, you can divvy them up into physical databases, uh, into separate databases. Um, the real trick is, is putting everything back together seamlessly. Um, so uh, what are some of the reasons that you might have for sharding? So uh, obviously, sharding to scale your application is, is really the, the first thing people think about when you think about sharding. Um, you, you, you might share also, uh, might shard because you're sharing data between multiple applications. Um, one of the use cases I'll talk about in a minute is uh, dealing with resumes. You're taking resumes from, uh, from your website, you're taking the, that applicant data and you want to put that in a second database because your HR department might need access to that same database, but does not need access to the database your website is stored on. And so uh, it, it helps federate your, your, your data um, in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and then that way it also lets you leverage other technologies. You, your, your, your website does not have to be just Drupal. Your website can be uh, Drupal for the content management system, uh, Node.js for uh, building Ajax uh, applications, um, you might use other storage technologies like uh, 
MongoDB, uh, which I will uh, talk about um, later on. So, so, so those are some of the reasons that you might shard. So, so how does sharding actually help? Well, uh, basically in a one-to-one -one with this last slide, um, sharding is going to help. Uh, it, it helps scale your applications because it lets you reduce the amount of data that's stored in one place. So uh, one particular type of, of sharding, um, which is the most difficult, horizontal sharding, um, actually lets you split every other row out of the same table and put those into physical databases, um, which is great because your data set is smaller, which implicitly means that your index sizes are smaller. It means that replication is going to be faster, uh, and it, that's, that's how that helps with performance. Um, so in the previous slide, uh, the reasons for sharding, um, sharding for shared application data. So how, sh how does sharding help with that? Well, you can take secure sensitive data like that, that HR data, um, personally identifiable information taken from resumes uh, and, and isolate it somewhere else so that you can have uh, your website and you kind of have to play it loosey goosey with certain uh, permissions in order to have that, that content readily available on your website. Um, but if you go through uh, expensive HTTPS layers to accept that data, then you might have a different transit route for storing this, this sensitive data in a more secure place. Um, also, it, it just helps you segregate your data into manageable chunks. Um, that that's that's how you can kind of leverage different technologies. You know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm not really going to go into Node.js and the things you can do with it, but uh, a lot of people are interested in playing around with that. You might have a Python or a Ruby application that you you have that you uh, need to share data with. So sharding your data helps you segregate that out, um, and uh, help help scale scale your applications. So before we get into um, sharding, uh, f specifically for performance gains, um, I want to make sure that we've covered everything else that you want to do for uh, performance. So first of all, um, make sure that you're using memcached, uh, which, if you think about it, really is data sharding. You're, you're, you're splitting the data that normally went into cache tables in MySQL. You're sharding that and taking that and putting into uh, dedicated cache servers. Um, the, the, the same may be actually be true with, uh, with the boost module. You're, you're, you're kind of sharding some of the responsibility of displaying pages from Drupal to Apache by creating um, uh, hard files uh, with the boost module. Um, you know, I kind of alluded to uh, load balanced web servers earlier, MySQL master slave replication. Uh, Drupal 7 is really good about uh, letting you mark uh, certain queries as being slave safe uh, so that they will only go to the to the slave freeing your master only for for rights or hopefully uh, only for rights um, that helps spread the load uh, to your data um, and, and, and one thing that people always forget about is, is also once you've created a view to create to display page to, to display blocks uh, sometimes it's a, it's a good idea for performance sake to take the most complicated views, you know, if you turn on the develop module, it'll show you which queries take the longest, uh, and, and turn those into custom queries as optimized as you can get them. So you want to do all these things before you really consider sharding your data, assuming that accessing the data is uh, actually your, your bottleneck in, in your site's performance. So those are the, the, the highlights, you know, the, the four or five things that people always tell you to do to help scale your site. There's a lot more that you can try. Um, so for, for, one, for one thing, you can, you can add more memory to your, web, uh, to your database server, um, add more CPUs to your web servers. Um, remember, memory is cheap, DBAs are expensive. So sometimes it helps to just throw more memory at the problem and maybe it'll go away for a little while. That's, that's a perfect example of vertical scalability. Um, Things like moving uh, uh, all your HD access into, into vhost configs so that Apache's not having to pros parse that every time. Um, Apache tunes, MySQL tunes, uh, you can go on and on. Um, evaluate whether or not you need all of those PHP libraries. I mean, um, show of hands, who actually needs the PDF libraries that, are, that come with most installations of PHP? 
maybe ten percent of us in the room have, have, have really had to do anything with uh, with PDF lib. So you can recompile PHP, reconfigure PHP to be as 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 bare bones as, as possible uh, to help with performance. So after you've tried all of these things, um, once you've done you know the the, the ninety percent of, of uh, the the easy work. Um, we're going to call this the easy work to uh, to make your your site scale. Your your web environment is probably going to look something like this. So you've got your load balancer. You have n number of web servers uh, doing the horsepower, crunching the PHP, displaying the content to users. Um, you may have um, a varnish server in between the load balancer. That may be your load balancer. But you might have a, a hardware load balancer. Uh, you may have varnish. You may have um, uh, a CDN that's involved in here somewhere, kind of between the internet and your load balancer. You've got cache servers. You've got multiple uh, cache servers because, again, memory is cheap. Um, you've got master-slave replication creating uh, database clusters. So this is a pretty typical, uh, ba well-balanced environment for uh, serving um, high-traffic Drupal websites. So after you've done all that and you, you, you still think you have performance problems related to your data, getting that data out, you have complicated data that you need to, you know, do joins and things that, that you know, get, get tied up in the, in the database that becomes a bottleneck, um, then we want to talk about uh, sharding. So what are the, 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 the types of sharding? Uh, there's two primary uh, approaches to sharding your data. Uh, partitioning in federation. So partitioning is is an example of that horizontal uh, uh, horizontal scale that we talked about earlier, where you you could just keep adding databases horizontally next to each other. These are these are you know basically in a sibling relationship with each other. Um, you're going to take a table, for instance, the node table. Uh, everybody's familiar with it. Uh, to horizontally partition that table, what you do is uh, all the even NIDs go to the first database, all the odd NIDs go to the second. So your database is now cut in half. And so you each, each table now has half the index size, half the data size, and roughly half of the overhead involved in, in getting that data out. That sounds like a, a good approach, but it's, it's really the hardest thing uh, to, to do. Um, the benefits are great though. You have a uh, much smaller index. You can, you can, you have much faster queries for the same amount of data. Uh, on the other hand, um, federation, um, federation literally means just a, a s creating a set of things. Um, it, it, it's, it's a little bit more conceptually logical. So that means uh, you're using uh, logical divisions like uh, geography. So you have a list of users, um, people who have submitted their resumes. You might break them into geographical regions, um, North America, Europe, Asia, something that's, that's conceptually logical um, rather than every other record. So um, it, it, it's, it's much easier to deal with federated sets. Um, it makes it a lot easier to break those up across multiple physical databases uh, so that you're not having to, um, to horizontally scale your, uh, your, your master-slave replication. <coughs> so uh, also the, uh, the difference is um, partitioning data. Uh, you do have problems if, if one database goes down, you've lost half your data. The, uh, the other thing with uh, uh, federating your data is since the data tends to be very discreet and atomic, if that goes down, your website is still up, you just don't have access to that particular thing at, at a time. So people can read about your company, they just can't necessarily apply for a job right now. So um, this is the hard one, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of get it out of the way um, because um, honestly, if, if you have to do some horizontal partitioning there may be some <laughs> other problems with uh, with the application that you're actually developing, whether it's Drupal or with anything else. But uh, it, a discussion on sharding is not complete until you've talked about horizontal partitioning. So, um, uh, 
scaling your, your application performance, uh, this, this definitely will help um, querying data out of your database make it faster because you're dealing with, with smaller indexes and it's, it's much more, um, uh, it's, it's leaner. Uh, um, so, you know, you have a distributed data load, um, so you're, you, you can run into fewer resource contentions when, you, uh, when you're making queries to your database, you're making half the queries, essentially. Well, uh, half plus one, I know, to, to be honest. So, um, but, but quite honestly, horizontal partitioning is, is the shard of, of last resort. Um, so it's important to note that this is not the same as master-master replication. So if you use uh, MySQL's MMM, uh, for instance, that's great. That, that, that really does help, uh, help a lot. And it's, uh, that's actually um, still just vertical scaling because you can only do that so long before you run into uh, replication contentions. Um, in uh, horizontal partitioning, you, uh, you, you, your rows are going to be divided be uh, among physical uh, databases, uh, which is great. That the, the, the more you can spread that out over different physical databases, the better it's going to perform for you. And if you can do that indefinitely, that's, that's perfect horizontal scale. Um, the downside is, um, and this is especially true when you're dealing with this in Drupal, it does require uh, custom database APIs. So um, I'll show you in a, in a, in a second how, how complicated this can get quickly. But, um, it, you know, uh, you can see that I was running out of room to describe some of the, some of the caveats to uh, running, uh, dealing with even an odd partition. Um, but uh, essentially the way uh, this, is, this is achieved in, in MySQL, just so everybody knows, is in every single table definition that has an auto increment value, you can auto increment that value by some other number than one. So, you know, every every node that gets inserted into the node table is auto-incremented off of the last one. So you can auto-increment that with a different value. You can auto-increment it by two or by three and then have a different auto-increment offset. So that's how you can achieve even an odd uh, table. Um, uh, and, and then you're, you're essentially having to do round-robin querying to find data that you need. If you know the node ID, you know exactly which table to go to. That's why it's, um, you know, n divided by 2 plus 1 uh, in terms of, of your performance uh, because you're, you're almost half of the queries uh, go to each, each uh, slightly more than half of the queries go to each database. So um, that all sounds well and good, uh, but you're, you're, you're your web cluster that was already getting kind of complicated suddenly starts looking more like this. Um, you'll notice that each web server now has an additional uh, API element to it. That's what that little uh, thin blade is sticking out of the side. Um, that, that is basically the traffic cop that says, you need to go to this database, you need to go to that database. Um, and for every single master and slave that you have in your primary database, you have to have in your secondary database. Your tables have to be consistent across the board because they are essentially mirror images of each other structurally and they just alternate data between them. So, uh, you know, it, it, it sounds great in theory to, to horizontally scale, um, you know, by sharding uh, between those databases, but it does, uh, it does get out of hand pretty quickly. So what I'm actually recommending then is federation. So federation, uh, federating, uh, feder federated sharding, uh, it's, it, it's still vertical, so you do still have a ceiling that you'll, you'll eventually hit. This helps you uh, essentially cut your data stock in half and replant it somewhere else. And they'll eventually grow and hit that ceiling, and then you can cut that off and, and stick it somewhere else. Um, uh, it, it's also perfect uh, for when you're going to be sharding for uh, shared application data. Um, you have your website that needs access to, to, to you know, user submitted data. Uh, the HR department needs access to that. The payroll department might need access to that same data. So that's all in a, in a separate database from your website. Um, and and it, it's, just, it's just helpful for manageability and for security. Um, uh, one, one example of security, by the way, uh, is that um, you can grant 
MySQL permissions to do pretty much everything you need to um, to uh, to read, write, uh, update tables to your primary website's database, which is all well and good if that gets lost because you have a backup of that, but nothing's ever actually revealed that's that's dangerous. And then you have your uh, resume database sitting elsewhere um, with much stricter permissions. You only have permission to select, for instance, um, you know, essentially a, a read-only database. Um, that way, uh, you might have a different MySQL user that, that talks to that database so that if one is compromised, you're not compromising the, uh, the, the, the whole. So um, vertically scaled databases, at first glance, it looks similar to the horizontally scaled databases, um, except you don't actually need the full database cluster replicated every single time. Uh, in fact, every single federated database cluster that you deal with can be different. In this case, we have the primary MySQL master and slave. In the second uh, instance, we have a master and a single slave. The slave might actually just be used to replicate data that is used by an internal user. That way, that's, that data is read-only. Uh, they only have read access to the database. They can't actually touch it. Um, a third instance might be you use MongoDB, Couch, um, some other uh, Oracle. Uh, you might you might have an Oracle database somewhere, and uh, so every every time you federate your data to a new data cluster, it can be a completely different. It doesn't have to follow the same thing every time, and it allows you to evolve your data applications as as you're working on them. So uh, that that brings me to uh, dealing with applica application sharding. So it's, it's not just sharding data, you can actually do the same thing to your application, to your website, by providing web services, you know, software as a service is, 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 is a big thing. Essentially that's what this is, is sharding the application as well. Um, so for instance, um, I, I'm sure most people have heard of Discuss, um, it's a third party plugin that allows you to do commenting. So you decide that um, commenting on your site is becoming too much of a resource hog um, in terms of you know, being able to serve content. So you switch to Discuss uh, or, or Facebook comments um, to provide the same functionality on your site. You're still allowing users to, to comment on your, on your content, but you've offloaded that to a separate, uh, a separate application environment. Uh, so, so you can do this to shard all sorts of components of your site. If you think about um, with a content dis distributed network, with a CDN, you can use edge side includes to also pull in specific pieces of the content. So you can actually be serving a, a static HTML website, and then your Drupal uh, instance for content management is specifically to create just the ESI fragments that are included in your static HTML website that is served by you know, Akamai or, or whoever. So uh, if you use uh, a, C a paid CDN, if you use Varnish, all of these things have uh, edge site includes in them. And so Drupal, in this case, is, is pure content. It's not display of content. It's just managing the content, creating those ESI fragments that are included elsewhere. So those are some just basic examples of, of application sharding. Um, some other uh, some other sample use cases, you know, I, I've, I've talked a bit about collecting resumes with your existing site and being able to do something beyond just what's in your, your normal website with that data. Um, also building an ideation tool so users can submit their ideas for your company to consider for the next product. And then other users can vote up or down, they can comment. On your on on that user's idea, so these are these are kind of two examples of applications that you can shard from your primary website. Um, so, when you're sharding resume data, for instance, um, and, and and I'll actually give some 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 code samples here in a minute and, and get to the more technical uh, explanations, but in this particular instance, you're taking resumes for a large corporation website. Um, users are going to submit the form. That form data that they submit is going to somehow magically appear in the HR department's database. They're going to have access to it. Um, and then that way, 
uh, you're not having to give admin access to every single person at the company. You have the webmaster, the site builder, whoever, the content editor managing the website. Uh, three or four people have access to the website, the sensitive data at that point. And then the pertinent information that the HR person actually would have an account for doesn't need one anymore because they use their internal data application to talk to the data that you collected through a different application. Uh, that would be your website. So um, how would you do that? So a couple of different approaches to uh, sharding schema. Um, so you can use the same physical database. It does not have to be in a separate database um, if you're just interested in sharing data amongst applications. Um, so you can, you can use uh, database prefixing um, to talk to a different schema, uh, or you can use uh, different physical databases. You're gonna use, you can still use all the Drupal DB API, uh, such as uh, DB write, uh, Drupal write record to write a new row to the database, uh, to update a row in the database. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same physical database that your website is, is using. Uh, which is which is pretty handy. So um, when you're dealing with database prefixes, it's all set up in settings.php. This is not module code. It's it's your Drupal's instance uh, setup. Uh, it's it's real simple. Um, uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar with uh, MySQL's dot prefixing. Uh, you can actually reference a different database from the one you're currently using by simply referencing a select star from database name dot table name. Uh, and that's essentially what you can do with prefixing tables. Um, it does require that uh, the MySQL user that your Drupal instance uses has permissions to at least select from this other schema. So in, in Drupal 6, it looks something like this. And in, in, in this particular instance, I think is, is taken out of the, the default settings.php. You can, uh, in this case, we're going to be sharing all the pertinent users' information between Drupal instances. Um, this is this is actually a, a, pr a fairly common trick when you're dealing with multi-site, but you want to share uh, the same user base. So it's simply referencing the schema name dot whatever. Um, in this case, if you looked at the shared table, uh, I'm sorry, the shared schema, the tables actually wouldn't be prefixed with anything. Uh, but as far as Drupal's concerned, it doesn't it doesn't care. It's just going to assume, okay, you want me to talk to this table. That table happens to have a schema prefixed, and uh, it'll talk to them just fine. So, yeah, my microphone's starting to slip. So, um, in uh, Drupal 7, it's very similar. Um, it's it's a little bit, little bit uh, uh, more uh, more complicated, but the idea is still the same. Your default prefixing. Uh, you can you can reference the same user tables. In fact, and this is just kind of an aside, you can use a Drupal 6 instance and a Drupal 7 instance, share the uh, pertinent user tables between the two so that a user can log into a Drupal 6 site and still be logged into a separate Drupal 7 install uh, by sharing these tables um, with, with, a with a couple of caveats. Um, so, so one is the, the user tables have to be updated to be compatible with Drupal 7. Uh, the password hashing scheme is a little bit different, and, and there's some other things going on with sessions. But once you've modified the tables to be Drupal 7 compatible, Drupal 6 still reads them fine uh, unless the, the password has been rehashed for Drupal 6. Um, so in that case, you should always log in on the Drupal 6 site and then redirect all user slash whatever on the Drupal 7 site to the Drupal 6 site so that everybody always logs in there. As long as the uh, domain names are, are the same or similar, as long as the domain cookies are set so that they're, they're compatible, then when you log in on the Drupal 6 site with these shared user tables, you will be logged in on the 7 site. So uh, one, one reason you might actually want to shard applications is you want to take advantage of some of the things that Drupal 7 has to offer with new modules, but you don't want to upgrade your whole site. So you can create a sitelet, uh, so to speak, 
um, and use something like mod proxy to serve your Drupal 7 site, which exists on a separate tier, as if it was a multi-site. Um, so that, that's how you would handle if you, if you wanted to share the same physical database, but you wanted different, different schemas. Now, for true performance gain, uh, you're probably going to want to look at using different physical databases. So you can, you can set up connections in settings.php. In, in Drupal 7, you can actually set it up in your module code as well. Uh, DB set active is the magic function that's going to basically handle everything for you. Uh, it will switch which database connection is being used. You can still use all of the Drupal API. Uh, and then set your database connection back to the original site's uh, connection. The, uh, the thing you really have to watch out for, and that's why it's bold, um, you will get burned while you're developing this. Um, when you're doing uh, schema caching, uh, caching any kind of errors might trigger uh, an error cascade because if you have a PHP error, a PHP warning, it tries to write that to Watchdog, it's going to say, hey, insert this into Watchdog watchdog table isn't there and then it freaks out because it tries to write an error which wants to write, write that to watchdog and it's going to find that that's not there and it's just going to continually uh, go downhill from there. So in Drupal 6 it's, it's pretty much as simple as this. Your DB URL um, that, that, that can be a string. Uh, in, in, in most cases it is a string. Um, it can also be an array. Uh, it's, it's not very well documented that that's the case, but you can make that an array. Now, th these do have to be the exact same type of databases. So when you're doing this, if your primary database is MySQL, all the secondary and tertiary databases also have to be MySQL. You can't mix Postgres and MySQL and uh, different, different, uh, different things like that. Um, but if you, if you want to do that kind of stuff, that's when application sharding actually comes in handy. Um, in Drupal 7, um, you, can, you can specify the database connection strings in Drupal 7 in, in the settings file, and it's going to look like this, where one of the arrays is default. You can create multiple strings, uh, and each connection can actually have different uh, table prefixing as well. Um, but in, in this particular case, this code could just be used directly in your module. So if you have, um, if you have an application that's seasonal, if you're collecting um, uh, you know, children's wish list for Santa, um, something that you're only going to run for, for three months out of the year, you might just store this in module code rather than trying to put this in settings.php to keep connection overhead down. Um, and it's, it's pretty much as simple as using Drupal's database object to, to add the additional connection information. Then you can go about your business switching the database, uh, s uh, setting the, the active database, execute your queries, and switch back. So <coughs> this, this is pretty much all you have to do once you've created your connection strings. You uh, first want to load the schema for the tables that you think you're going to be writing to. These are the tables that you've defined in your modules install hook. Um, and, and it's not explicitly required that you do Drupal get schema, but trust me, that's, that's what you want to do. The reason for that is when you, when you use DB set active and you connect to a new physical database, you're talking to a completely different database at this point. When you use something like Drupal write record and you say, I'm writing data to this table with this row of data, the first thing Drupal write record is going to do is look for the table definition, the schema definition for that table out of cache. It's first going to look in code cache, in static code cache. Then it's going to look in the cache tables. Um, because we didn't load it the first time, it's not in static code cache, uh, it's going to look for it in various cache tables and it's going to freak out because those cache tables don't actually exist in your other database. Um, and it's going to say, oh, that's bad. I need, a, I, need to, I need to make a, I need to warn my administrator about this. So he's going to look in the systems table to find out where errors should go. And the system table is not going to be there. And so it's going to default to Watchdog, and that's where you get that, that downhill uh, slide of, of errors that, that will just ruin your day. 
So that's why you want to go ahead and load the schema first. That way it's, it's static code cached. Uh, you, you, you don't run into those problems. So you want to switch your database, execute your queries, do what, do what has to be done, and then immediately switch back before you have to do anything else in Drupal. Uh, you'll notice the second time uh, we don't actually pass out a, a, a parameter. You just It's going to assume default. Um, so when, you, when you're saving data in another database, uh, so, so what, are, what are the advantages really to, to switching database connections in the first place? So one is that you can still use all, the, all of Drupal schema definitions uh, that come in install modules. Um, you still have access to using all of the database APIs uh, that everybody knows and loves. Um, you know, um, it lets you, lets you deal with smaller databases for your website, uh, which is great if you, if you have master-slave replication. Uh, it helps keep master-slave replication lag down so that when you write something to the database and you turn around and try to read it in the next, on the next page load, for instance, uh, it may or may not be there because of replication lag. So this helps keep the, the lag down. Um, and it just makes things more manageable. Uh, you have less overhead in your database. It's going to help that perform a little bit better as well. So in, in, in the case of, of, of our resume use case, uh, the resume is submitted via the form on the website. They've, they've gone through, they've filled everything out, they've uploaded their actual CV, their resume, their, their Word doc, their PDF, whatever they have. The, the submit function for that form, uh, it takes the data, it's, it's, it's already been validated at this point, and the submit function is, is, is going to do, that's where, that's where all of that goes. So it's going to load the schema, uh, it'll connect to the HR instance of MySQL. Uh, it'll it'll write or update the record depending on uh, if, if this is a new resume or if they're just updating their, their old one. And then immediately switch back. And in that way, uh, you don't have to worry about reports running. You don't have to worry about exporting that data. Um, the, the HR director or whoever manages that sort of thing immediately has all the updated resume in their database right away. So. Not only are you not having to store excess data in your website's database that, that the website itself doesn't need, uh, your HR director has that information right away. It's also secure because it's not being physically stored in the same database as the rest of your website. So if your website gets owned, um, they don't have access to uh, data outside that database. Um, at least that's the hope. So. So that, that's if you want to use MySQL. There's lots of other options. Um, you know, you can use uh, you can use uh, Oracle uh, if you have some some legacy applications internal to to, uh, to the corporation. And yeah, lots, lots of folks still use Oracle. Um, you can also use MongoDB. You can use CouchDB. These are these are NoSQL databases. Um, is, is anybody familiar with NoSQL? Uh, play around, good. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, so essentially what, what, what this means is it's, it's, it's schema-less. So there is no table definition like you're used to in MySQL. There, there are no columns. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's essentially just you're shoving documents into the database. Um, in the case of uh, Mongo, Couch, and a few of the others, um, they're stored in, in Bison format, which is binary JSON format. Um, and you can query these things as if you're parsing a JavaScript, uh, a JSON object. Uh, it's very JavaScript-like syntax, um, which is one of the reasons why it plays so well with Node.js, uh, which also has uh, JavaScript syntax. Um, MongoDB is very fast. Um, it's it's, it's, it's uh, significantly faster reads than MySQL. Um, so if you're, if you're doing something uh, with an application, um, like an ideation tool where um, there will be occasional writes. You know, somebody submits a, a, an idea or they vote on an idea, but most of the time people just want to read the different ideas and see, see how their idea is coming along with all the votes. Uh, it's very fast because um, it's, first of all, it's stored in a separate database that's only doing that. Um, and it's document-based, so you get everything kind of all at once in, in a lump. Um, Mongo databases, um, well, not specifically uh, because you're using Mongo databases, but because uh, they're geared towards storing documents. Um, 
the data tends to be very uh, denormalized. Um, and, and I'll actually show you some examples. Now, if you actually want to find out some more information about uh, Mongo, uh, for those of you who are uh, in or around uh, London, Mongo uh, Tengen, the folks that, that, that uh, build uh, MongoDB, uh, we've got a conference here uh, next month. Um, they actually do have uh, several Drupal-related sessions, so there's, there's some good, uh, there's gonna be some good crossover there. So I unfortunately can't make it, but it uh, should be pretty good. Uh, so dealing with MongoDB in Drupal, um, there's a MongoDB uh, module. Uh, it's been around for a little while. There's a D6 and a D7 version. Uh, the, the, the Drupal 7 version is really, really good. It's mature. Um, it has the basic MongoDB API as well as modules to let you store all your field content. Um, you can store cache. You can store sessions. All, all this data can go in Mongo database rather than in the MySQL database. So things like... Um, um, fields that, that once you've created the node, once you've created your content, uh, you're not really doing a whole lot of writing to it, so you want that to be as read-friendly as possible. So you store that in Mongo databases, uh, it's going to be quicker uh, to load those fields. Um, you can also use the, this module to just create your own connections to the Mongo database uh, at any of the four object levels that they have. Um, which the four object levels uh, that when you're dealing with Mongo connections, you have the actual connection itself, uh, that's an object. Uh, you have um, the database connection, which is the equivalent of the schema in uh, MySQL. You have the collection, which you could think of that as a table in MySQL. That's the collection of all of those particular documents. Um, that would be the entire collection of your resumes, the entire collection of your comments, the entire collection of your um, of your idea uh, in your ideation tool. Um, so, and then, then you have the cursor object, which is the collection of results from a query. Um, uh, the PHP drivers for Mongo tend to be very object oriented, so if you're very comfortable there, um, it's, it's, it's good for that. So, a sample Mongo database document might actually look like this. Um, again, it's, it's, if you're familiar with JSON, there's no surprises here. It's it's it, it is JSON format. Uh, it's technically it's Bison uh, because it's binary stored. But this is a sample uh, document that you you might have in Mongo uh, database. Now, say this guy didn't have um, an existing title. He didn't fill out an address. Uh, then that information would just be not present in the document for his resume. Um, and then querying. Uh, using um, using the MongoDB um, uh, module, you, you write in your module something that would look like this. This would get you uh, the the collections object that you see here. That's a collection. It's referring to a collection, uh, and then applicant is the actual cursor uh, that that you create from that by finding uh, from from the applicant's collection. So um, just a real brief intro to the syntax. The first array is I'm looking for usernames um, Smith, uh, or last name Smith, surname Smith, uh, that has a social security number. That's a, that's a uh, since, it's, since it's just a number, it's just saying you know one or zero, that, that has put in a social security number. Uh, say that's all you're looking for in, in, your, in your search. And then uh, just give me back his the first name and the last name. That's that's all that's going on in this query. So that's all well and good. Um, you can you can write a custom module uh, in in Drupal that might get back some of the results uh, of of the resume. You might have something similar going on uh, in the HR department. They have their desktop application or some sort of internal intranet application that might be done with Drupal um, and with Open Atrium or something like that, where you're you're getting that resume data. Um, but here's the, here's, the, here's the interesting thing, is you don't actually have to get this, the data out with the Drupal module at all. Um, so Mongo uh, has built into it a, a very simple uh, REST API. So you can actually, if you're on the same domain, um, use uh, AJAX, uh, jQuery, whatever you're comfortable with, any kind of JavaScript in the browser to 
make a uh, JSON request, um, an AJAX request to the MongoDB servers itself, um, hitting the REST interface and actually being able to pull that data um, out and, 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 and you'll actually get JSON data. Um, if you need something more complex, um, you can write your own. You can also use uh, Sleeping Mongoose, which is uh, uh, it's built in Python. Uh, MongoDB REST um, is just a Node.js implementation that sits on top of this, actually lives on the Mongo database servers. So in this case, um, sharding has helped you by creating a JavaScript application that's fairly uh, fairly static. It's, it's static HTML at this point and you're bypassing the web server entirely once you serve that initial page. So um, you, you can actually query the databases yourself through JavaScript. So um, for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with REST, it really is as simple as, as get making a request to a specific ID, uh, to, or I'm sorry, to a specific URL. Um, the first path, that ideation, is uh, the, the database uh, ideas is the collection of documents that you're dealing with. Um, the, the, the second sample here is just saying, hey, I want um, all of the comments out of the ideation database whose parent ID matches this 4, 8, yeah, blah, 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 that, that long uh, ID. So um, to do anything more complicated, you'll, you're likely going to need a dedicated MongoDB REST interface. But uh, um, you know, check out check out Sleepy Mongoose. Um, check out uh, Node uh, the the Node JS version. Uh, they're both pretty good. Um, so anyway, that, that's enough about talking about Mongo itself. So um, talked earlier about uh, dealing with applications on separate web tiers. So um, keep in mind that application sharding is the same thing as data sharding. Once you've separated uh, the application, where the application lives, it's having to talk to that data in a different location anyway. Um, so where you write your data, where you read your data from is really inconsequential uh, in terms of your primary Drupal website. Um, it doesn't have to be the same database. Um, in fact, you can have multiple Drupal instances. You can have a Drupal instance that just manages your website. You have another Drupal instance that manages your ideation tool. Um, for collecting new ideas about products. You have another Drupal instance that does uh, just collect resume data. Um, and and, you, and you, whatever, whatever other use case you can think of, you can actually create a separate Drupal instance that's very lightweight, it's very lean and mean, and does just that one thing. Um, rather than building another module, having uh, a monolithic Drupal uh, website that runs everything. So. Um, so how would you do that? You could you could use mod proxy uh, at the very uh, at the very least to uh, create a new path on your primary Drupal website um, slash applications uh, your 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 whatever example.com slash applications is now actually a mod proxy reference to this other web tier entirely, but to the user there there is no difference. So um, the Proxied web clusters, uh, uh, this is what, what this slide is called, uh, is just an illustration of your original uh, web tier. Uh, and you can, you can these, these look similar, but they, uh, they, they, you, can, you can create completely different web architectures for everything uh, outside of the load balancer. So you have your primary group of website um, represented by the, uh, the large cluster on the left. Uh, then you have your, your ideation tool, your applications tool, everything uh, it can be a separate web tier uh, and all served out of the uh, out of out of the same website to the user, but uh, they're actually charted into separate applications. So uh, in short, that's some, some of the different techniques that you can use. Um, you can take advantage of uh, sharding. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, Anything that you uh, you want to see more of or talk more about? <laughs> that's a, that's a really really good question, and um, I uh, I thought about uh, talking about that. Oh yeah, so so the so the question was, how would you hook that um, into using views 
um, and, and some other uh, some other real common modules. That's that is really tricky. Um, so if you if you're if you're dealing with MySQL data um, in a separate um, schema in, in that very first instance where it's a shared schema, same physical database, it's very easy. Your your table is going to be prefixed with the uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the database information is going to be prefixed with the table name. So views is not going to know any different. It's going to work identical to uh, to how it would if it was all in the same same schema. If it's in a separate physical database. That's where you get a little tricky. Um, what you have to do in that case is the module that actually manages um, talking to the separate database that, that handles the um, DB set active, does the queries there, and switches back. That module is also going to be responsible for maintaining uh, a lightweight lookup table in your primary Drupal database. So in, in that case, what you would do is you create sort of a stub table uh, that contains just the very minimal information for uh, views to at least see it. And so if you're dealing in Drupal 7, you can create um, you know, a handful of entities that, that it will know about. You define the entities. You don't actually have to store the information there. Um, so you've created the definitions that views is going to be aware of. And then you can um, have um, um, views alters whenever that view uh, comes along. You can actually alter the, the results uh, from, from the views query by uh, injecting the data from this other physical database into that. And you would take basically the same approach if you're doing this with um, MongoDB. Uh, if, you're, if you're using uh, Oracle or any other thing that you're storing data in, uh, it's basically just you, you have to kind of handle them in separate cases. Uh, any any other questions? Yes, in the back. Okay. Okay. So um, the, the the question is, uh, you know, I was talking about the uh, the the speed performance of reads in MongoDB, but I didn't really talk about um, how it compares when writing uh, to MongoDB to to, to MySQL. Um, it's it's still a little bit faster. Um, it's it's quite a bit faster, th and I don't have numbers. I, I, I w that's a really good question. I, I wish I had thought about um, getting some numbers for you on that. Um, in short, um, MongoDB writes still outperform uh, writes for MySQL for a couple of reasons. One, when you're dealing in Drupal, most of your writes actually occur over multiple databases because your data is normalized, and so you're writing multiple tables. Uh, in MongoDB, you've very likely um, denormalized your data, and so you're you're writing um, uh, to one document one time. So that's that's a little unfair to say that MongoDB is faster. It's also because your your schema has made it so that your writes will be faster, um, but. Apples to apples, if you're writing the same sort of documents, uh, MongoDB writes do um, fairly well um, as long as you have very few indexes. Um, where uh, MySQL regains ground is when you're doing a lot of updates to existing documents and you have a large document set. Um, now with that said, um, MongoDB's threshold for what a large data set is usually about four to five times bigger than what my, uh, MySQL's large uh, data set might look like. So in MySQL, you start to notice performance drops uh, when you hit, you know, uh, one to two million rows. You really start seeing uh, degraded performance. With Mongo, um, it's it's really uh, since everything tries to be done in memory, uh, it 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 does as very little as possible to write to disk. So disk is usually freed up, um, so you don't have file I/O contention. Um, MongoDB, you might get uh, 10 to 15 million documents of the same type of document that, sh that you would store in, my, in uh, MySQL before you start seeing uh, performance issues. Um, so, did, 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 that, did that really kind of answer the question? Okay. All right, anything else? All right. Um, if you, if you do think of uh, more questions, uh, here's my contact information. Um, uh, T. Hagler at phase2technology.com. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at phase2. Uh, I actually don't have it on here, but my uh, Twitter is 
T Hagler. Same as my email address on my tobyundy.o. And uh, these slides are going to be available on uh, agileapproach.com, which is phase two's uh, technology blog, as well as uh, the, the session page uh, for, uh, for this conference. So, all right, thank you.